-hmm. Take it away, A.G. Jennings. Jill, thank you so much for that great introduction. And uh, Dee, thank you for being here this evening and for being a leader with Jill uh, in this terrific organization. And, and thank you, friends, um, for participating because it takes all of us to make change, even in our small state. I see many old friends like Mimi Boudart and hopefully uh, many new ones as we talk this evening. So uh, I'm really honored to be speaking with you tonight. I am by nature a criminal law attorney. <laughs> I, I grew up in the Department of Justice and um, also spent several years uh, defending criminal cases. And so uh, when I became attorney general in 2019, we realized in our leadership team that it was fundamental to our mission, that we swing for the fences, that we do the tough stuff. And as former Senator Ted Kaufman is, is known to say, hard stuff is hard to do. And one of those issues, uh, one of those major goals that we have worked hard on and that we are swinging for the fences on is our environment. It's our mission to make sure that the people of the state of Delaware lead lives that are better for the work we do. And our environment is one of the fundamental goals that we have uh, in our state. When I came into office, it was on a promise to, as I said, take on these tough issues and the environment is central to our plan. I will say that um, for the DOJ, for attorneys general in our state uh, historically and for attorneys general generally, this has been uncharted territory in that we have taken on the role as chief litigator um, to work for improving our environment, and defending against those who would roll back improvements that have been made. We can make significantly positive impact given our jurisdiction and authority. It gives us wide latitude uh, to investigate and litigate on behalf of all of you, of the people of this state, and also to advocate for our state and its interests at the federal level. We all know how necessary that work is. Let's look at where we are as a state. We are in the midst, and it's, it's no surprise to you, we are in the midst of a global climate crisis as a direct result of our dependence on carbon and as a direct result of the deception of the fossil fuel industry over decades, among other causes. Despite wholesale denial from those climate change deniers, climate change is no longer a hypothesis. It is a daily reality. It is already inflicting damage to our health, to our economy, and to our agriculture. Delaware is the lowest lying state in the country. And as a result, it is directly threatened by climate change in a way that we have already seen. And it's not some remote problem. There are already communities in our state where homes are literally collapsing into an encroaching waterline. We are staring down a clean water crisis. Both point and non-point source pollution has compromised the majority of our state's streams and waterways. It has threatened our ecosystem and our economy to say nothing of our infrastructure because much of our nation's public water works were built with funding from the Clean Water Act of 1972. And that funding and the, the infrastructure built upon that funding is approaching the end of its useful lifespan. We are similarly facing a clean air crisis because of our upwind neighbors and wind currents that make our region the nation's tailpipe. 
a fact that was exacerbated for years by insufficient federal regulation on other states' emissions. And as a state that has long been known for its chemical and agricultural industries, we are reckoning with a legacy of pollution. There are those who assume that environmentalism is an out of touch academic philosophy. They are dead wrong. This is a kitchen table issue for our state because we live on the front lines of each one of these threats. Some of our work includes ongoing investigations that I will not be able to talk about this evening because I am required to keep them confidential until they are public. So as much as I would love to, I'll be able to discuss some things, not everything. But I am excited to talk to you about the things that I can share. Let's start with big oil. The best known step that the Delaware Department of Justice, our office, has taken is likely our lawsuit against big oil, including Exxon, Chevron, BP, and dozens of other defendants, I believe 22 in total. The day we announced that lawsuit was one of my proudest as your attorney general. Our litigation is ongoing and it will be for quite some time. And therefore, I am limited in what I can say about it because we cannot compromise the integrity of our case. Too much is at stake, but I can tell you what I have said publicly. We are suing Big Oil because they knowingly deceived the public for decades about the threats their products posed. Our state is already paying for their malfeasance. These are some of the richest, most powerful companies in the world. Exxon, Chevron, and other mega corporations knew exactly what kind of sacrifices the world would make to support their profits. And they misled all of us to downplay that risk. Now we are staring down a crisis at our shores. And it is taxpayers who are footing the bill for that crisis the damage to our roads, the erosion of our beaches, the degradation of our environment, and the hit to our economy. As a direct consequence of these defendants' conduct, Delaware's environment is changing. The impacts on our communities, including and especially black, brown, and poor communities in our state are devastating. The poor sections of the city of Wilmington are and we believe will continue to face substantial flooding. In a state where virtually all of our eastern border is coastal or tidal, we have already experienced over a foot of sea level rise. That number could rise to over six feet by the end of this century. More than 22,000 residents are currently threatened by coastal flooding. It threatens our beaches, which support our fourth largest industry, 44,000 jobs, and one of the main pillars of our economy. And it threatens our agriculture industry with drought, saltwater intrusion into agricultural soil, crop losses from changing weather patterns, and higher costs to maintain a farm. There is no reason that any of us should be footing the bill for the conduct of big oil. This lawsuit is seeking one thing and its simplicity is that it seeks one thing, accountability. We know this lawsuit won't stop climate change. That is an even larger issue and fixing it is a job for our nation's policymakers. What this lawsuit does seek is to recover costs that Delawareans have already paid and will continue to pay because of the defendant's direct conduct. Moving on, PFAS. Also on the legal front, we entered almost exactly one year ago into a first of its kind settlement with the companies DuPont, Cortiva and Comores over the presence in our natural resources and communities 
of forever chemicals that were produced, sold, and disposed of in this state for decades. Forever chemicals, as you know, refers to a family of chemical compounds called PFAS that are extremely persistent in the environment and are linked to a wide range of health dangers. They are so toxic, in fact, that the EPA has just published new threshold limits that are orders of magnitude stronger than previous guidance, 175,000 times lower in one case. This was the first time that the DOJ has resolved natural resource damages claims on behalf of Delaware. At a $50 million initial value, which we expect to increase to $75 million by decade's end, it is by far the largest environmental settlement ever secured by our government in our state one of the largest settlements of any kind in Delaware history. It's unprecedented for the Department of Justice, and there may be some who believe we should never have gone after a company like DuPont. But let me be perfectly clear. The law in this state applies to everyone. We represent the people of the state first and foremost. And we have a duty to ensure that nobody is above the law or beneath justice. PFAS contamination is an issue in all three counties, but make no mistake, these three companies were only responsible for a portion of the contamination. You have a right to a safe and clean environment. And while I cannot yet go into greater detail, we are committed to pursuing the other sources of PFAS within our state as we speak. Let's talk about Monsanto. Finally, we have retained counsel in a lawsuit against Monsanto for contamination of chemicals known as PCBs, which only Monsanto manufactured before they were banned in 1978. These chemicals were used for decades before they were banned and are known to cause cancer, serious liver damage, depression, and depressed immune system functions, impaired learning capacity, and many other issues. And to make matters worse, they do not break down when they enter the environment. Many of our natural resources are currently contaminated by PCBs. They are now commonly found in fish, birds of prey, marine mammals, and other species throughout Delaware. Monsanto knew and understood that. In fact, they marketed how persistent they were as a positive feature of their product. In spite of that knowledge, they decided they could not, and I quote, afford to lose $1 of profit, end quote, and actually increased production because selfishly too much Monsanto profit would otherwise be lost. Now, decades since the ban on PCBs, Delaware taxpayers are still footing the cleanup bill. We have incurred significant cleanup costs and will continue to incur such costs long into the future. There are other initiatives that we are working on as well. We successfully co-led a bipartisan coalition of 21 states in objecting to PCP contamination class action settlement that sought to interfere with state AG authority to protect state's natural resources. We sued the EPA for failing to hold upwind states accountable for ozone emissions that blow into states like Delaware, and we won. We sued the Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Land Management to protect the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and the Coastal Plain from oil and gas drilling. We sued the Trump administration to stop its attempted clean car standard rollback. This work is urgent because this problem threatens us all. It calls on all of us to work together and to do everything in our power to keep it from getting worse. And it is an opportunity for us to reclaim our future and to hand our children and our grandchildren 
a better environmental legacy. My job is to fully utilize the power of the Attorney General, and fortunately, other Attorneys General are thinking the same way and marshalling all of their offices, resources, and authority to take on this cause. I would be remiss if I didn't end on this note, however. You are probably aware of the case of West Virginia versus the EPA. And before the end of the Supreme Court of the United States term, in the next couple of weeks, we will see a decision in that case. It is possible that the Supreme Court of the United States could declare it unlawful for federal agencies to make, quote, major decisions without clear authority from Congress. Wetlands, it could affect wetlands protections, limits on car and truck pollution. It could, it could affect the authority of the government to protect greenhouse gas emissions and the right of the EPA to limit greenhouse gas emissions across our country. The legal issue, which because I'm a lawyer, I have to mention, <laughs> is um, whether the EPA has authority to determine major questions in our country. The idea that executive branch actions with vast economic political significance require Congress to act is really the core of the issue before the Supreme Court right now. And it is where you draw the line between executive authority and legislative power. If the Supreme Court declares that the EPA does not have authority to limit greenhouse gas emissions, then it will be left to Congress to do so. And we can fully expect that Congress will be unable to do so. This is a monumental decision that is coming out any day now. And I really hope, I hope the decision is very limited, but I do fear like a lot of legal scholars across the country that it will be broad and will have impacts far beyond greenhouse gas emissions, which is a gigantic impact in and of itself. So I wish I could leave you on a, on a happier note, <laughs> on a more optimistic note, Except to say this, um, the fact that you are here with us tonight, the fact that you care so deeply about the environment where you live, that you care so deeply about our children, and in my case, my two little grandchildren who are 18 months old, um, that gives me hope and that gives me you know, the energy to keep going along this path. Thank you so much, and it's really a pleasure uh, to be among you tonight. Kathy, thank you. That That is um, uh, both encouraging on one side and um, with the Supreme Court issue, um, uh, very, very, very discouraging. Um, so I, I know folks have questions and I'm trying to read the chat. So I'm gonna ask you to, uh, raise your hand and maybe keep your questions to questions and keep them brief. Um, Delaware fight corruption. Do you wanna ask that question? I'm not quite sure who the person is behind that. Can, can you ask that question? Yes, thank you. It's Phil Gross. Um, uh, I guess the, the best way to put it is uh, I've been trying to reach uh, you, esteemed uh, Attorney General, but these are some questions that I have. Uh, in relations to Glassdale down in uh, Delaware City, uh, there were some questionable uh, things that were done by Nicole Poor and uh, Representative Lawson. Um, and we've been trying to reach out to you for your help and we've received no uh, response. I've emailed, I've called, um, I've contacted some of 
the people in the uh, DOJ at certain events, and it seems like it's being brushed under the carpet. Uh, we as concerned citizens are entitled to, uh, you know, them being investigated. As you said, no one is above the law, and there's environmental issues going on down here in the city of Newcastle as well that have been covered up. Uh, there's sinkholes, there's just so many problems and uh, no one seems to care. So I'm counting on you uh, to be focused on local issues and not just big corporations. We, we need your help. It's the election cycle and you need us. Sure, Phil, thank you for your comments. And with me this evening is Mary Grace Colonna. And Mary Grace, if you would be kind enough to, in the chat, put up a, a number where Phil can reach out directly to us. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will respond. We will respond and engage with you. Well, the question first. is, do you have any comments regarding either of these uh, two matters? I don't no, at, no. at the moment. That's That would be inappropriate for me to do at this point. Was Roland had a question as well in the chat? I, I have a hard time reading and talking and thinking at the same time. Roland, are you there? A Roland there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And I guess Dee's been answering a little bit of it. Um, but there's a, there's a code that I believe, from what I understand, is in the books. It's the law uh, that builders have to build to net zero ready by 2025 for residential and 2030 for commercial. I know that Newcastle County has been having some meetings to try to figure out how to make that happen. To build to that level, I'm a passive house consultant. That's where I, I, I live in that venue of passive house, which is a building certification process to build highly efficient homes. So, if you build to that level, and it's really difficult, you add solar panels and you would be zero. So what they're asking in that code is to build to passive house level. And I'm, codes are getting more strict, so we're getting there. But in my mind and a bunch of other people, there's no way these builders are going to make it by 2025. And I don't know what happens to them when they don't. So I'm, curious about that actually. Yeah, Roland, um, I, you know, Delaware attorney generals have jurisdiction over a heck of a lot of things, but housing codes is not one of those. And, no, no, and I understand that, that. This is the code. And what happens when a builder doesn't meet that code? Does that break the law? I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't speak off the top of my right. head on that. I can just right. tell you that, you know, I just spent a year in the county and I at working in the county and I know that there are codes and that there are consequences for violating those codes. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, just, well, at least you're now aware of that code and maybe you'll look into it and maybe it's it's a couple of years away, but it's worthwhile working on to, and actually one of the biggest issues is builder training. We need to get the workforce up to be trained on how to build to that level. And I think Dee's working on that too. I have no Dee, doubt. you have any Dee, information Dee, on that? Dee is, uh, is one of the strongest advocates <laughs> for all of you. <laughs> I guess, well, I'll just say maybe, I guess I'm the eternal optimist. We, as you know, we have been having meetings and public webinars to try to um, begin the education process and make sure everyone knows um, about this is a state code requirement for all the counties. So the Correct. counties control land use and the state has told them to meet these deadlines. So um, we, we, I was looking into it before we were even aware of the state requirements because we wanted to move the ball forward on green building. And that's how I found out about the state requirements. And I, I think, you know, Newcastle County is ahead of the other two counties in even doing anything about it. 
And um, we have, we actually have a meeting coming up, Reed, maybe you'd like to join us. So I was just about to message you in the chat. Um, but I mean, we do have two and a half years to get it implemented and to continue doing training. So I don't know, I certainly hope that's enough time that our last webinar, which was in March, was all about uh, builders who are already do it, meeting the standard in Delaware. And granted, it's not all of them by any means, but there are a handful of them that are meeting that standard now. And so that gives me hope that um, they might go kicking and screaming, but uh, they they will have to meet that standard unless unless the state code changes. So right. anyway, I'll follow up with you, Reed. But if they have to meet it, what happens when they don't? That I don't know. I, I can't yeah. answer that question, but right. I suppose someone could take them. Well, if, if it's a county law and they're not following the law, then certainly someone could take them to court. Who that it's would a, be, I'm not sure. I don't know if that would law, be Kathy's, Kathy's role or, or not. Yeah. In the, but it's a state law. Yeah. It's well, a state we... law, but they wouldn't. But if they, if the Newcastle County has the code and they're not following Newcastle code, it's a county issue, not a state issue. It's one, and then the other issue is if all three counties have implemented the code by the deadline. So is it the counties breaking the law or the builders? It could be both. Who knows? Right. Right. But um, it, it's certainly possible that the other two counties won't meet that deadline. Yeah, so well said, Dee. And certainly it's something we can look into and get back to you in terms of ultimate enforcement authority. Cool. I got my voice out there tonight. <laughs> you do. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. Sharon, I think, has a question. Kwiatkowski, you want to ask your question, Sharon, wherever you went? Oh. Um, sure, I'll ask it. Um, I was I was wondering whether or not, I guess in my, per I love what you, I, I think you're a wonderful attorney general. Thank you. I'm a Thank big, you. and um, I, I am curious your thoughts on House Bill 405, which is, if, if, if everybody else isn't familiar, is it is, would create a new, for us in Delaware, an office of inspector general, which I guess in my opinion, I'm thinking you could use all the help you can get. <laughs> you know, we're so far underwater with crap here, being such a tiny little state, we have a lot of bullshit going on. I, I was just thinking that this could be very helpful for you. And, and, um, and if you want any help pushing it, um, you're, you're talking to the right people, you know. If you wanted help to to get that passed for you, thank you. And and we are supportive. I have I've spoken to Representative Kowalko about the bill. There are some technical aspects of it that require some wordsmithing, et cetera, as is always the case with a with a big new um, bill that uh, hopefully will be signed into law, you know, before June thirtieth. But we are supportive. Good, good. We'll help you. We'll help you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Sharon. So where is it in the process? That's not one of the bills I follow. Uh, my, my understanding is it's in the house. My understanding was they wanted to uh, talk to you and and others that that you know, were, were, would be involved in whether or not there'd be overlap and whatnot. And I know uh, the leg, Letty, Letty would be better adverse at this. The, the league had questions as to whether or not it would be overlapping and, you know, but, but. Yeah, and that's, and that's what needs to be wordsmith, quite frankly. Um, and so that, that's something we're working on right now with our representative. Okay, as long as you want it, I'm good. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think it's I think it's good government, right? We need an independent um, inspector general who oversees the how how is government working? Is it working for you? Is it working efficiently? Is it doing its job? 
Del, Del Cog obviously is the one that that came out with this with with thank heavens uh, um, Coalco too, which I'm so sorry to see retire, but um, but that's all. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I I have a kind of a related question, I guess, to Sharon's question, and not to put Kathy on the spot, but I was just wondering if she's familiar at all with. I think it's HB 220 that Medina has led the charge on, which is the Green Amendment, um, which would be a constitutional amendment giving people the right to clean air, clean water, um, and it, it goes on from there. I, I understand that there's some concerns, particularly about one clause in it. And of course, being a constitutional amendment, it has to go through two different general assemblies. But I just wondered if you were, familiar with it and what thoughts you might have on it? Well, I fundamentally support the fundamental right to clean air and clean water. And that's the work I've been doing since I was sworn in in 2019. I mean, we're, we're taking on the big fights. And so I certainly commend Representative Medina, Medina Wilson uh, for you know putting that forward as a constitutional amendment. It's really important. Um, it should be a fundamental right. I tell you, Dee, as I sit here today, that uh, we're going to need, like everything else, to read the details of that bill uh, to say more than that. So talking about bills, do you, do you have any thoughts on this SB 305 that we were talking about earlier? Yes, I can tell you um, that we support legislation. Uh, we are supportive of the legislation. Uh, so that's that's really all your office can do, right? So it's it's kind of that's in the in the governors and. Um, I'm interested in how you you interface with uh, Denrec. Um, how how does what's that mechanism? So we have five divisions in the Attorney General's office. One division is the Civil Division that has historically um, counseled all of the state agencies, including Denrec in terms of legal advice. And so there are lawyers in the Civil Division who interact with DENREC um, on a regular basis to answer legal questions that they have. We have a separate division um, that has within it what's called impact litigation. It is separate from the civil division and it's housed in our fraud division. And the whole purpose of impact litigation is to bring those really big lawsuits that will have the most impact on improving the lives of Delawareans. Just like I talked about with the climate change lawsuit that is housed in impact litigation and it's entirely separate from you know, whatever advice the civil division is giving to their client, Denrec. But overall, we interact with Denrec on a regular basis. Um, with all decisions that get made, as we should. You know, we talk things over with them about things like PFAS and PCBs, et cetera. And they know where we're coming from if we are considering uh, bringing a lawsuit against a company. And, you know, we know where they're coming from. So that's really important to do in state government. And that's over and above the legal advice that is given. Um, I'm happy to say that we have also had a fellow um, for the last few years who's just been tremendous in um, advising us about our impact litigation um, and especially environmental litigation. So impact litigation covers all of our environmental lawsuits that I mentioned tonight, but also covers things like our opioid lawsuits and other multi-state lawsuits we uh, engage in with the 
you know, with our colleagues, other attorneys general in various states, like, you know, we ended up suing the United States Postal Service during the 2020 election because the mails were being slowed down and we thought and knew and believed that that was a purposeful action to slow down, uh, among other things, vote by mail. It was affecting people who couldn't get their prescriptions um, mailed to them in time, et cetera. So it was a, a life-saving issue as well. And so we sued the United States Postal Service and we won that lawsuit along with other attorneys general. So that's, that's what impact litigation is. I mean, it is what it says it is. And it's a separate arm of our office. And I hope you have 25 lawyers in that particular office. Well, we need it. <laughs> we need 25 <laughs> lawyers. But, you know, we have really talented people and we're just very, very fortunate um, to have talented leaders in the office who, like I said at the beginning, they want to swing for the fences and do the really tough stuff. Um, and environmental litigation is way up there. Let's just hope that the Supreme Court does not, you know, pull the rug out from under all of these efforts in the coming two weeks. We will watch that carefully. Yeah, so I unfortunately am going to have to leave you all. <laughs> and um, can you please take just my question? Oh, of course, I'm sorry. Who is asking? Pat Todd. Pat, hi, Pat. Um, does the governor have the right to remove a bill after it's already been passed by the Senate? I'm speaking about Senate Bill 305, which is a climate change um, a, a reduction of carbon emissions bill. And um, it passed the Senate and that now the governor has removed it um, from the House. It seems to me that that he's interfering with the separation of powers. Um, he does have the right after the House has um, heard the bill and voted on the bill, either uh, for the bill or against the bill. He does have the right to veto it, but does he have the right to take, take it away before the House has, has um, had a fair hearing on it? Boy, Pat, you asked the easy questions. <laughs> I can tell you that that's something I'd have to look into. Um, I'm not going to give a, you know, an off-the-cuff answer to that very important question. I have tremendous respect for our governor. I have tremendous respect for his judgment and for his legal acumen and for the lawyers who advise him. Um, and so... I'm not going to give an off-the-cuff answer to that question because I can't. Okay. And I would just add that I, I, I don't know the details either, but I would have to imagine whoever the House sponsor is would not have, he would, the governor can't do it without the House sponsor's cooperation. So That's the House, Senator Hansen. Or is it a Senate bill? I thought it was a House bill. Which, no, wherever it came from, the Senate. whoever the sponsor is would would have to be the one to technically, um, you know, delay the bill. I, I, I don't think the governor can do it directly on his own. That's just it, my guess. It was in Deb Heffernan's committee, um, and she um, pulled the bill. Yeah, there are other ways to do desk drawer vetoes, but. The, the governor's the governor can't do it himself. He has to have cooperation from somewhere in the legislature. So um, I think what you're saying, Dee, is it's still in Representative Heffernan's committee, and it has. I think so. Yes, been... it was heard in committee, but not. It's on hold in committee. It wasn't let go out of committee yet. Is my understanding? Yeah, I'm. I'm... I'm not sure, John Irwin. Kathy, you have to go. I don't want to hold you. And we are so appreciative of having you not only here, but as being our attorney general and having the um, uh, impact litigation. And I know that Delaware is, is safer and healthier 
and we are on a good track. And um, I want to say, you go, girl. <laughs> well, you get so, you all give me the energy. Thank you so much for inviting yeah, me, and yeah. I'd love to come back. So uh, anytime. Yeah, well, keep us. We want it when the, when the next uh, uh, shoe falls in any of these litigations. Uh, we we will invite you along. That would be absolutely wonderful. So thank you, thank you, thank you, um, thank you, and, and good you evening. And Mary Grace can, Grace can sign off, and if any of us want to stay and chit chat, we can do that. Thank you, Kathy. Take care, everyone. Thank Thanks you, for your hard work. Thank, thank you. you.